to ask everybody as everyone is coming in, um, if you're recording, I think it'll be the pre-recorded version. Is everyone okay with that being uh, moved into the Slack channel? Okay, if not, let us know. Uh, Brian, you did just log in. Do you wanna try real quick to share your, pop up your screen, say hello? Uh, and if you could also, Brian, rename yourself to be uh, your number, which I think you are uh, 11. So 11 dash your name. Brian, did you were you able to hear me there? Uh, I was not. Can you could you read? Could you rename yourself to eleven dash your name, and then just yes. real quickly try to share your screen here, and then we're going to get started. Cool, can do. Um, while Brian is testing, uh, I think everyone has been put in, just been put in from the wait room. So uh, welcome to our session. Um, looks like we have a good turnout here. Um, I'm excited because we've got a nice uh, slate of talks. So. Um, yeah, Brian, it's showing. Good. Um, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get uh, get moving right into it. So we uh, try to stay on time. I'm gonna we're gonna work to try and stay on time as much as possible to try to leave some time in those question blocks that we're gonna do after. Uh, so the the process is we're gonna have four talks and then a block of uh, questions. Um, so. Um, Without any further ado, uh, I will uh, start by introducing our first speaker, uh, Dr. Zach Merrill um, from BioX Consulting, um, and he is going to present predictive modeling of serious injury risk in frontal crashes. And Zach, your camera is now pointed down at you. Okay. Yeah, you I'm, I'm trying to get this figured out. All right, you're good. All right, is this all showing up? Yep. Okay. All right, so my name is Zach and I'm an engineer at BioX Consulting here in Pittsburgh. Um, so we're a biomechanics forensics firm and a large part of our focus involves um, analyzing injury risk during car accidents. So my presentation today is on predictive modeling of serious injury risk in frontal crashes. All right, so like I mentioned, um, a lot of our work involves injury claims due to motor vehicle accidents, with a lot of our work being on the defendant side of litigation. Um, so we do both plaintiff and defendant sides. So depending on which side, we'll either be explaining um, why certain injuries were not possible or not likely to have occurred in a given accident, or we'll be explaining how an injury occurred. Um, so some of the previous studies in this area have looked at some of the correlations between anthropometric and crash parameters, um, looking at the risk of injury occurrence for a given automobile involved in a crash, and comparing the ability of some different metrics like acceleration severity index and overall change in velocity when predicting injury risk. Um, so my goal for this abstract was to develop and validate predictive models for individual risk of serious injury and in frontal crashes with airbag deployment. All right, so we got our data from the National Automotive Sampling System Crashworthiness Data System, which is a large uh, nationally representative sample of car accidents. So on the right is a sample of the type of information output that we can get from this database. So it has a lot of things like occupant info, so um, height, weight, sex, age, um, use of safety systems like airbags or seat belts, um, a lot of crash descriptions and diagrams, measurements like the delta V impact area, uh, principal direction of force, and then a lot of injury summaries for each of the occupants. So um, which body parts were injured, um, also things like which specific mechanisms cause the injuries. Um, so for the injury uh, definitions that we used here, we use the abbreviated injury scale or AIS, which ranges from one meaning a minor injury to six, which usually means like untreatable or fatal. 
where serious is defined as being a three or higher. So um, a score of three here usually corresponds to something like a fractured humerus or femur, um, lacerations of internal organs or blood vessels. So for my analysis, I counted a score of three or higher, including fatalities, as being serious. All right, so we used the 2010 through 2015 data set. Um, I used the 2010 through 2014 to develop the log logistic regression models to predict the serious injury risk for each individual. Um, this was done based on their age, BMI, sex, restraint use, and the change in velocity of the vehicle during the accident. I then used the 2015 data set um, as the testing or validation set to see how well the models actually worked. Um, so consistent with what we would expect kind of based on prior studies, um, we found increased injury risk with increased BMI and increased age and also with the lack of restraint use. Um, for testing the validity of the models, we used the area under the ROC curve and we got a value for that of 0.85, which indicates that this is an overall good predictor of the serious injury risk. All right, so overall, um, the results quantified the full distributions of injury risk for individuals in these frontal crashes, um, just based on their specific anthropometric parameters, um, restraint use, and some crash parameters. So this is gonna kind of serve as a first step for developing more comprehensive models for predicting injury risk in individuals in car accidents. Um, so the longer term goal here is kind of to develop and validate models that'll look at um, various impact locations and direction of force angles. So again, not just looking at frontal accidents, but also um, like side and potentially rollover accidents. And the results of this could be something that we could use in our reports and expert witness testimony basically to say that a certain injury was very unlikely to have occurred in an accident or point out that an injury most likely did occur as an accident. Um, so that's all I had. So let me know if you have any questions. Cool, thanks Zach. And we will move on to our next speaker who is Mohamed Homanyonpour from the University of Utah. And the title of his talk is Force and Acceleration Differences After Head Impacts Based on Clenched and Relaxed Neck, mu neck Muscles. Uh, thank you for your introduction. I'm Mohamed Homanyonpour and uh, my advisor is Dr. Andrew Merveder and we're uh, from University of Utah. So 3.8 million sport-related concussions occur in the United States each year. And not surprisingly, many of them are related to American football. In one study, it has been reported that most of the concussions occurred uh, when the player did not know about the incoming impact or did, uh, did have a poor posture at the time of the impact. But the reason why preparation is effective is still unclear. Some researchers uh, correlated that to stronger and active neck muscles at the time of the impact, while others failed to support it. Also, it has been shown that uh, the head instantaneous center of rotation moves further down with uh, muscle activation in coronal lateral flexion impacts. Uh, to further investigate the possible roles of preparation before an impact on the reduction of the risk of concussion, we hypothesized that first, head kinematic may change with cervical muscle clenching, and if it does, how? And second, the applied force may change uh, with clenched muscles. Uh, to test this hypothesis, uh, we created a safe head impactor capable of applying impacts in four different directions, front, back, right, and left, in random order. We measured linear and angular acceleration using an, uh, an uh, instrumented mouth guard, its athlete intelligence vector. Uh, we tested 10 male participants, and in seven uh, non-directional trials, a sound played one second before the impact and the participant asked to clench as soon as they heard the sound and then they had the impact. In 10 on one trial though, participants had the impacts while they have been waiting uh, for the warning sound, but they never heard uh, the warning and they had the impact. 
So let's jump into the result. In columns, we have sagittal extension impacts, sagittal flexion, and coronal lateral flexion impacts. In the rows, we have linear acceleration, uh, rotational uh, acceleration, and force of the impact. We have the unwarned trials, the trials without having any warning with the blue lines, and the clinch trials with the uh, red lines. In sagittal extension, uh, peak linear acceleration decreased by 16% when the muscle was completely clenched, but angular acceleration increased by 14%. In sagittal flexion, we measured reduction in linear acceleration and increase in angular acceleration due, but uh, they were not significant. In coronal lateral flexion, peak linear acceleration decreased by 10% with muscle clenching, and also angular, angular acceleration decreased by 21% as well. By comparing the linear accelerations in different directions, we can see significantly higher linear acceleration in coronal lateral uh, flexion impacts. And also, if we uh, compare the uh, um, angular acceleration, we can see uh, there is a second peak at the rebound phase for the angular acceleration with the relaxed neck muscles, while with the clenched neck muscles, we just had one uh, peak with, uh, in the red lines. And also, if we compare the uh, peak uh, forces, we can, in, uh, we can see increase by muscle clenching, uh, but it was just significant in lateral impacts. Uh, as a conclusion, for the first hypothesis, we measured that kinematic of the head changed based on the, based on the impact direction and muscle clenching. Uh, we can conclude that clenching could be effective as a protective mechanism by decreasing the linear acceleration of the head, and also clenching could avoid or decrease the peak angular acceleration significantly in the rebound phase. And also, we measured that neck strength was only significant in sagittal extension. To answer the second hypothesis, we measured that the applied force did not change more than 4% with clenched muscles, while linear and angular acceleration changed over 14%. So the force wouldn't be a good predictor for linear and angular acceleration without the direction of the impact and also the level of the muscle activation. Also, we think the peak angular acceleration in the rebound phase may be responsible for a higher risk of concussion in unprepared athletes. As a future work, we propose improving the head and neck in dynamic models to replicate this effect uh, of muscle clenching on the head movement. Uh, and I want to acknowledge NSF and uh, Nayash for their funding and ASP for this time. Thank you. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody, we are going to be utilizing the chat for our questions. So if you have questions for our speakers, please enter them into chat. Um, and when we get to the end of our block of four, we'll have a 10 minute question period. Uh, our moderators will address some of those questions. Uh, questions that we do not get to will be moved over to the Slack channel that's associated with this talk. Uh, with this session um, and hopefully we'll have some continue some vigorous uh, discussion on our Slack channel. Um, our next speaker is our um, co-moderator for the session, um, Josh Leonardis, uh, coming from University of Michigan. Um, he is going to talk about uh, choosing mastectomy and breast reconstruction or breast conserving therapy implications for pectoralis major function. Thank you, Zach. The vast majority of breast cancer diagnoses can be managed with breast conserving therapy which refers to the combination of lumpectomy to remove the tumor in a small volume of soft tissue, followed by radiotherapy to the entire breast in order to reduce reoccurrence of the disease. And when radiotherapy is applied to the entire breast, it takes in the vast majority of a muscle called the pectoralis major, which is essential for healthy shoulder joint function. Despite a vast majority of women eligible for breast conserving therapy, we see an increasing number of women eligible for a less invasive option, instead opting to undergo mastectomy 
and the immediate subpectoral implant breast reconstruction. Now, mastectomy is a highly invasive surgical procedure that removes all breast soft tissue in an attempt to eradicate any cancerous tissue. An immediate subpectoral implant breast reconstruction aims to reform the breast mound after mastectomy, but it requires the surgical disinsertion of the pectoralis major away from the costal cartilage and up onto the sternum. Now we know that both of these options can have some pretty significant effects on shoulder joint function, but it's not really clear how these options influence the integrity or the function of the pectoralis major itself. So the purpose of this study was to assess the effects of breast conserving therapy or mastectomy and subpectoral implant breast reconstruction on the, the function of the individual fiber regions of the pectoralis major. This assessment included a, a patient population of 14 women previously treated with mastectomy and subpectoral implant breast reconstruction. They were about 18 months or more out from treatment. A, four, a group of 14 women previously treated with breast conserving therapy and a group of 14 healthy age match control women. When we examined isometric shoulder strength, we found that breast conserving therapy resulted in significantly reduced shoulder adduction strength when compared to control participants and significantly reduced internal and external rotation strength, whereas mastectomy and subpectoral implant breast reconstruction only resulted in uh, significantly reduced shoulder adduction strength. In order to assess the function of the individual fiber regions of the pectoralis major, we use something called shear wave elastography, which is a, an imaging technique that estimates the material properties of muscle using the velocity of shear waves. If we obtain shear wave velocities at rest and during active contraction, it can provide us with, with some insight into how the individual fiber regions of the pec are contributing to shoulder function. So for our patients, we ask them to either remain completely at rest or to generate and maintain shoulder torque scale to 10% of their max inflection or adduction while I obtain shear wave elastography images from this, the clavicular and sternocostal fiber regions of the pec. So these are representative images from one participant in each group and result in shear wave velocities, uh, the shear wave velocity color, color maps, and a cooler color like blue represents a lower shear wave velocity or a lower contribution, and a warmer color is a greater shear wave velocity or a greater contribution. And if you're just visually inspecting these patients, you can see that there are some differences between these individual participants and how they activate and how the different fiber regions of the pec contribute to joint function. But these are indeed just representative participants, uh, and they don't represent the entire picture. But if we plot shear wave velocities obtained from the clavicular and the sternocostal fiber regions during the generation of flexion, and adduction torques, it provides greater insight. So these are linear mixed model fits in a shaded region representing 95% confidence interval obtained from our healthy control participants. And what you're looking for here is that with an increase in shoulder torque magnitude, you have an increase in shear wave velocity in both of those fiber regions, regardless of the direction of the torque, whether it's flexion or adduction. Now, if we plot those data alongside data obtained from our breast conserving therapy patients, we find some group differences. In particularly, we find that the breast conserving therapy patients underutilized as represented by a less dramatic slope, the clavicular fiber region of the pec during adduction and the sternocostal fiber region of the pec during flexion. If we plot the same data obtained from our subpectoral implant patients, we again see that these patients underutilize the clavicular fiber region of the pec during adduction and the sternocostal fiber region during flexion, but that they increase the contributions from the clavicular fiber region during flexion. So while there was just this you know, blanket reduced contributions in the PEC in our breast conserving therapy patients, there's more of a redistribution in our subpectoral implant patients. So the, the shoulder strength deficits that we observed in these groups are likely the result of an underutilization of the PEC during after breast conserving therapy and kind of a shift in the contributions between the fiber regions after mastectomy and subpectoral implant breast reconstruction. So what it seems like is that these groups are both adopting unique, albeit ineffective compensation strategies. And I think it'll be important to expand our vision to include other muscles of the shoulder and how though their contributions change after breast conserving therapy or mastectomy and subpectoral implant breast reconstruction. Thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. So far, next.
Josh, I think you're muted. Switching between screens was a little wonky. Uh, we have our next speaker who is Whitney Wolf from the University of Michigan. And the title of her talk is Quantifying Sternocleidomastoid Material Properties After Definitive Chemo Radiation for Head and Neck Cancer. All right, thank you so much for the introduction. Head and neck cancer makes up approximately 4% of all new cancer diagnoses in the United States and the incidence is rising. The yellow line in the figure to the right demonstrates the increasing incidence of one of the most common types of head and neck cancer, which is driven by cancer caused by the human papillomavirus, shown in blue. Head and neck cancer is commonly treated with definitive chemoradiation. However, survivors of head and neck cancer often experience functional morbidity following treatment, including fibrosis, pain, and upper limb dysfunction. There's currently a gap in the literature objectively quantifying the neuromuscular changes throughout treatment, and there's no standard of care for post-treatment morbidity. Therefore, the purpose of this study was to quantify the acute changes to the elasticity of the sternocleidomastoid, or SCM, following chemoradiation treatment for head and neck cancer. The SCM was chosen because it's commonly included in the radiation field throughout treatment. We hypothesized that patients would exhibit increased shear wave velocity both at rest and during volitional contractions three months after starting treatment when compared to baseline. We recruited four non-metastatic head and neck cancer patients who had their cancer managed with chemoradiation treatment. They had their first visit prior to beginning treatment and returned three months later for their post-treatment visit. Patients were seated in a chair with their head secured in an instrumented halo equipped with a six degree freedom load cell. They completed one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional isometric neck torques in order to match 26 submaximal targets displayed to them on a screen. These targets were distributed about a sphere and represented equal combinations of neck flexion extension, left and right lateral bending, and left and right axial rotation. We collected ultrasound shear wave elastography data while the patients were at rest and while they completed their target. This calculated shear wave velocity is strongly related to a tissue shear elastic modulus, which provides insight into material properties of the SCM, both at rest and under volitional contractions. We had three outcome measures at the pre and post treatment visits. The passive shear wave velocity provides insight into the material properties of the muscle while at rest. The preferred direction provides the direction in which the SCM is most highly activated. And this is best visualized as an intensity sphere, such as the one in the bottom right-hand corner. This sphere plots a visual distribution of the shear wave velocities obtained at each target with warmer colors representing a higher shear wave. The axes of rotation shown are the ipsilateral bending and contralateral bending in green, the flexion extension in red, and the contralateral and ipsilateral axial rotation on the blue. The um, preferred direction would be represented by the darkest red, which is in a combination of ipsilateral bending, flexion, and contralateral axial rotation. We also collected the magnitude of the shear wave velocity nearest the preferred direction, which provides insight into the level of activation. We then completed repeated measures ANOVAs to compare variables from the pre to post treatment. The passive shear wave velocity significantly decreased from pre to post treatment. And our preferred direction for each participant was in a combination of flexion, ipsilateral bending, and contralateral axial rotation. Representative intensity spheres from one patient are shown on the right, with the pretreatment shown on the left column and the three month follow up on the right. The left SCM are the top two spheres, and it's rotated in a way to show the preferred direction. And the bottom two spheres are rotated slightly differently to show the preferred direction from the right SCM. The preferred direction did not change significantly from pre to post treatment. However, the level of activation or the mean shear wave velocity at those preferred directions significantly increased from pre to post, which can be visualized by the darker red in the post treatment when compared to pre treatment. Overall, the SCM exhibited greater shear wave velocity during volitional torque production, but a decrease in passive shear wave velocity. This suggests that the SCM has altered elastic properties immediately after treatment, but this change is not driving the increase in shear wave velocity during torque production. The increased SCM contribution may be due to pain or neck dysfunction. 
These early results may be useful in identifying patients in need of early physical rehabilitation, but future work is still needed to quantify the late effects of chemoradiation on neck function to better predict those who experience lasting morbidity. I'd like to thank everyone who helped me with this project and all of our funding sources. Uh, thank you, Whitney, thank you to our, of all of our first four speakers here. Uh, we've got a, a short time period here to have some questions. Uh, again, if you have questions for our speakers, please add them to the chat. Um, the, if we uh, have some time, we'll ask the speakers those. But again, all those questions will move over to our Slack after we're done. Um, I'll start us off with a question um, for Zach. When you're using BMI as your, um, in your model, is that, are you using um, standard 30 as your cutoff for determining uh, your odds ratios? Or is it a higher um, one? No, so for those, we just calculated the BMI directly instead of doing like the different obesity categories. Um, okay. So it was just based on um, their given height and weight in the okay. uh, NASS output. So just a like put in as a linear variable. Yeah. Um, and do, do you, uh, what, what's the, do you have a mechanism by which BMI drives to increasing injury risk? Why is that? Um, so I think one of the ones I heard is that, you know, if, if you're in a frontal crash and you're moving at the same speed of the car, if you're heavier, obviously it's going to take more force to slow you down. Um, so I think that's largely it. It's um, mostly like an inertial thing, um, but I'm not totally positive on that. Okay. Um... Josh, uh, we'll, I think we'll move Ooh, on. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this question is for Mohammed. Uh, Aaron Drake asked, I know some new brain injury metrics take rotational velocity into account. Did you or do you plan to investigate skull rotational velocity in the future? So actually, we have measured the uh, skull uh, rotational velocity in our study as well. And the result, I can, uh, I, I just wanted to talk about the acceleration here, but the result shown that. Uh, most reduction actually with muscle clenching uh, with the uh, angular velocity and it was up to 24% reduction when the muscles was clenched at the time of the impact. Very cool. Thank you very much. Um, I, I will move on. Probably just one question for everybody as we were a little bit behind in time. Uh, so Josh, a question from Emily. Can you share a few examples of activities of daily living where these women may have challenges associated with the shoulder changes you're uh, demonstrating? Yeah. So uh, while we didn't directly collect uh, much activities of daily living data, just communicating with these women, um, it seemed like things like taking on and off clothes, definitely taking on and off a bra where you have to you know, forcefully internally rotate and you operate over a pretty large range of motion. Those were both very difficult. Uh, not so much reaching to a high place, but once you grab something from the high place, controlling that item down was, was also very difficult for them. Um, the PEC itself contributes to flexion, um, internal rotation and adduction. So anything that requires, you know, bringing your arm across the front of your body, uh, rotate, internally rotating would be of difficulty, but those were three tasks that I heard pretty frequently were a problem. Excellent. Do you have a question you want to ask Whitney? Yes, or? yes Whitney. Um, very nice study. What is the significance of passive shear wave velocity? Does it indicate a change in muscle tendon composition? Also, was neck pain or disability measured in your participants? Yeah, so thank you. Um, and the passive shear wave velocity does indicate a change in the muscle competition, composition, and we were expecting it to increase because of the known fibrosis that occurs at the SCM after treatment. Um, but the decrease in passive shear wave velocity that we saw, we expect to be a side effect of the muscle healing after the radiation itself. Um, and we also think that the fibrosis may be a late effect of radiation and that those changes don't start occurring until later on in the healing process. Um, and then neck pain and disability were measured. We had multiple patient reported outcomes and the neck disability index from each time point that we saw them, um, but it wasn't included in this presentation because it was so short and I haven't made my way through those data to analyze them yet, but we do have all that information. 
Thank you. Um, we definitely didn't have time to get to all of our questions. So if there's a posted question that didn't get answered, please uh, tune into Slack to get that. Um, if you have additional questions you'd like to ask our speakers also, please, uh, please tune in, ask a question. Uh, we'll, we're gonna set up a Slack thread for each of our talks. Um, our next speaker is Emily Mativich um, from Vanderbilt University and the title of her talk is Estimating Lumbar Loading with Wearable Sensors over a Broad Range of Manual Lifting Tasks. All right, uh, thanks so much, Zach. Um, as you said, my name is Emily. I'm from Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. And today I'll be talking about using a small number of wearable sensors to provide big insights into low back loading. Numerous occupations, such as this order picker at a warehouse, involve repetitive manual lifting that puts the low back at risk of pain and overuse injury. In order to better understand these overuse injuries and mitigate risk, it would be valuable to monitor the repetitive loading on the low back in these real world environments. Wearable sensors offer an exciting opportunity for monitoring human movement outside the lab. Most commercial wearables aimed at combating low back pain or injury typically use one or two sensors to give feedback on posture or monitor overall activity and tell users when to stand up or walk around. However, there are limited solutions for estimating the loading on low back structures. Some solutions in the research phase were developed and validated on a limited range of manual lifting tasks, making their application to the organic motions performed in a workplace environment unknown. Because high and or repetitive forces on the low back are known to be major risk factors for pain and overuse injury, we were motivated to design a wearable solution that uses a small number of wearable sensors to estimate low back loading over a broad range of manual lifting tasks. To achieve this, we synchronously collected both lab-based and wearable sensor measurements, while participants each performed over 400 different manual lifting tasks, involving varying amounts of leaning, bending, and twisting, while moving or carrying boxes weighing from 10 to 50 pounds. We used our lab-based measurements, motion capture and ground reaction forces, and inverse dynamics to estimate our target low back loading metric, lumbar moment, which has been shown to be associated with injury risk. And next, we use different subsets of wearable sensor signals to develop algorithms that estimate lumbar moment from these signals. And this was not a purely black box process, but rather a workflow that involved both biomechanics and data science insights to strategically prepare data sets and iterate through testing, training, and validating of the most promising machine learning regression models. Our early stage results using data from three participants shows that gradient boosted decision trees with K-fold validation by participant is a promising approach. We aim to design a wearable that required a minimal number of sensors. So we first envisioned a solution that only had signals from a wearable pressure sensing insole specifically force and center of pressure. And I'm going to show results for the lumbar extension moment on the y-axis with more negative values being larger magnitude moments for a snapshot of three lifting tasks across time on the x-axis for an example participant. When comparing our lab-based estimate of lumbar moment in green to our wearable estimates in orange, our algorithm using only insole signals does not well capture trends in higher versus lower lumbar moment. We next envisioned a solution that utilized a trunk inertia measurement unit, a commonly used sensor for posture and assist devices, and used upper body orientation signals as an input to our machine learning models. While this algorithm captured some trends in lumbar moment, for some tasks, it poorly estimated the more extreme lumbar moment magnitudes. We also tried a multi-sensor approach in which we combined data from both the pressure insole and trunk IMU and found that this sensor combination well captured trends in lumbar moment. When exploring all three participants' data, we have identified the second two sensor subsets shown here as promising options for further exploration. We're investigating both the overall error and time series results to gain better intuition into the benefits of each of these subsets. For example, a system containing only a trunk inertia measurement unit cannot capture when a participant lifts a mass and the total force under their feet increases, which results in an increase in lumbar moment. 
Of note are additional are initial explorations adding more sensors to these subsets, such as additional IMUs, did not substantially improve our results, suggesting a small number of sensors may be sufficient for capturing key trends in low back loading. We're still in the exciting early stage exploration of this project and have found promising solutions for monitoring low back loading from our three participants of data using biomechanics, wearables, and machine learning. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. All right, our next speaker is Jacob Banks from UMass Amherst. And the title of his talk is Lower Back Demands During Induced Lower Limb Gait Asymmetries. Cool, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, as you just heard, I'm going to be talking about lower back demands during induced lower limb gait asymmetries because our bodies need to and are built to locomote. For centuries, doctors have touted the benefits of walking, with some claiming it as a near perfect exercise and perhaps a remedy for minor discomforts in our psychological well being. Unfortunately, not everyone may be, may be able to capitalize on walking in this way. Individuals with unilateral gait asymmetry, such as the difference between left and right step lengths and stance times, have up to a four times greater prevalence of lower back pain than in healthy, able-bodied individuals. These asymmetries often manifest in people with lower limb amputation, leg length discrepancy, leg mass differences, or limb, lower limb joint dysfunction and pain. So as a biomechanist, I'm interested to see if our body's motion and internal force adaptations are responsible for the incidence of lower back pain in these populations. And of course, I'm not the first. Prior studies on lower back biomechanics of asymmetric gait in clinical populations have already demonstrated that in some, primarily amputees, gait asymmetries can lead to a large, larger muscle and vertebral forces. However, while insightful, these studies are often limited by more some uncontrollable factors like a lack of a true baseline comparison in clinical populations that walk at different walking speeds and exhibit a wide array of secondary complications or compounding factors. Also, in terms of modeling the lower back demands, previous studies have all relied on generic optimization algorithms that do not take into consideration participant-specific responses and models that were not directly evaluated for their use in gait. Therefore, to combat uh, these experimental challenges and to better control for specific uh, characteristics of gait asymmetry, we designed a repeated measure study which temporarily and safely induced gait asymmetries in 12 otherwise healthy able-bodied participants. In our experimental setup, each of our participants walked at 90% of their preferred treadmill speed, speed across all conditions, while we recorded EMG on six bilateral trunk muscles in full body motion capture. In addition to normal unperturbed walking on a treadmill, we induced asymmetry with four perturbations intended to mimic clinical sources of asymmetry where the right lower limb was perturbed by either making it artificially longer, heavier, both longer and heavier, or restricting the ankle motion and adding mass with an ankle boot, with a walking boot. To estimate the L5-S1 demands, we modified and evaluated a poor gait in existing open sim full body lower back model that incorporates participant specific uh, kinematics, trunk strengths from MVCs conducted against uh, a biodex dynamometer and EMG muscle activity. Trunk muscle forces were partitioned according to Colawicki's EMG optimization in a custom MATLAB API. For those of you unfamiliar with the EMG optimization approach, like static optimization, muscle forces are optimized on a frame-by-frame -frame basis to balance all the joint moments simultaneously. In our lower back model, there are 18 joint moments to balance. However, unlike static optimization, EMG optimization uses recorded EMG values in, in, in optimization so that it can incorporate participant-specific recruitment patterns and co-contractions. This framework of incorporating EMG optimization within OpenSim in our preliminary evaluation of this approach was presented last summer's Computer Sim Conference. So what did we find in terms of perturbations? As expected, statistical tests indicated that most of our four perturbations caused participants to walk asymmetrically with generally longer stance times on unperturbed limb and corresponding longer step lengths with a perturbed, with a perturbed limb. This coincides with what you would expect to observe in clinical gait asymmetries, where participants will want to get off their injured limb quickly and stay on their healthy limb longer. However, in terms of lower back demands, these changes in spa uh, spatial, temp spatial temperature asymmetry did not result in L5-S1 compressive or shear forces that were different from our baseline unperturbed condition. This was surprising as we had originally hypothesized that lower back demands would increase in the presence of asymmetry. 
But as you can see, results from our model indicate that in healthy, able body participants, this may not necessarily be the case for level walking on a treadmill. Therefore, the, incident, the high incidence of lower back pain associated with asymmetry could be the consequences of subtle insignificant increases in loads, other daily activities like load carriage tasks, which we are currently looking into, or a complex interaction of multiple contributing factors, all of which warrant future investigations. With that, I thank you for your attention. I welcome any questions afterwards or in one of our other mediums. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Blake Johnson from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, and his talk is Material Properties of Human Testicles Under Unconfined Compression and Probing with Variable Strain Rate. Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for attending our virtual presentation. First off, I'd like to thank my co-author and uh, advisor during my PhD, Dr. Campbell Kiergan, for collaborating with me on this work as well as for continued mentorship and guidance. Advancements in the material characterization of human tissue has a large impact as it can improve various fields such as forensics, prosthetics, diagnostics, and many others. Previous literature on human tissue has already identified that material properties can be affected by the methodology such as the type of material testing apparatus used as well as the testing strain rate. Furthermore, an organ where the material properties have not been characterized is the human testicle. Thus, our goal is to establish the elastic modulus using various strain rates in an unconfined compression protocol and probing protocol, as well as measuring the failure properties in an unconfined compression protocol. It is hypothesized that as strain rate increases, the elastic modulus will also increase and that the elastic modulus will be different between the probing and unconfined compression protocol. Six testicles from three cadavers ranging in ages of 76 to 98 years old were procured for this pilot study. Two types of testing were performed, which were non-destructive testing and destructive testing. Both probing and unconfined compression protocols were used in non-destructive testing, where the tissue was pressed to a strain below failure and then allowed to recover prior to subsequent testing. The rates were varied between 1% per second to 25% per second. Only the unconfined compression protocol was used for destructive testing, which used rates between 25% per second to 500% per second. All protocols used the Mark 10 material testing system that collected force and displacement that were then used to calculate the stress and strain using the equations displayed here. T-tests and ANOVA were used for hypothesis testing. Here we have the elastic modulus for both probing and unconfined compression protocols plotted against the strain rate. Right away, you can see the incremental increases in stiffness due to the increases in strain rate. Both protocols almost doubled in stiffness going from 1% per second to 25% per second. You can also see that the probing protocol always resulted in a stiffer elastic modulus than unconfined compression. On average, the testicle tissue tested in probing was 106% stiffer than the unconfined compression protocol. Next, we have the stress strain plots for the destructive testing results. As it is seen here, a strain rate dependency was observed for failure stress where 25% per second failed at a stress of 0.27 megapascals, while at 500% per second, the testicle failed at stresses over 0.8 megapascals. What we have learned from this pilot study is that the elastic modulus was stiffer using a probing protocol versus an unconfined compression protocol. This could be due to the surrounding tissue around the probe being involved in the deformation, but not included in the calculation as strain in the probing protocol uses the area of the probe instead of the area of the organ. It was also found that the stiffness in both protocols was strain rate dependent and failure stress was also observed to be affected by strain rate. Failure strain, however, was not uh, observed to be affected by strain rate. Through observation, it appeared that the possible maximum of failure for the testicle is the surrounding tissue of the organ, which is the tunica albuginiae of the testes. Overall, we were able to characterize the material properties of the human testicle in both probing and unconfined compression protocols. It was found that the probing protocol resulted in higher elastic modulus versus unconfined compression. Strain rate was also found to be a factor that affects the elastic modulus and failure stress. The properties that were found here can be very useful for researchers modeling testicular injury. However, additional studies are needed in order to explore the entire range of testicular mechanical properties. I would now like to acknowledge the United States Department of Defense for the funding for this project. And now I'd like to open up questions for the chat or in the Slack channel that has been previously mentioned. Thank you all for attending.
Our next speaker is F.J. Goodwin from Elon University. And the title of his talk is Vertical Stiffness Asymmetry in NCAA Division I Athletes. All right, again, uh, thank you for everyone for joining this talk. I'm F.J. Goodwin uh, from Elon University, uh, Department of Physical Therapy. And we'll be looking at vertical stiffness asymmetry in Division I athletes uh, this afternoon. So again, uh, we know that uh, Division I athletes uh, continue to suffer higher injury rates uh, through the last decade and, and years before that. And what we are interested in is determining, is there an appropriate screening protocol that might actually reveal who will go on to get injured during uh, an athletic season? Um, we believe, and, and the data shows that potentially vertical stiffness is a potential screener tool for, for lower extremity injury risk. And potentially in a preseason situation, uh, they're found to be, if there are asymmetries between the lower extremity, lower extremity stiffness, that the athlete potentially goes on to get a soft tissue injury or is at greater risk for a soft tissue injury later in the season. Um, and so what vertical stiffness is, is looking at peak vertical ground reaction force divided by the amount that the limb compresses during ground contact. So if you see here on the lower portion of the screen, um, we have uh, the center of mass represented on a massless, massless spring, and we are interested in how much that leg deforms during ground contact phase. Uh, the purpose of this study was to identify if there were any significant differences in vertical stiffness asymmetry among incoming Division I athletes. Uh, previous studies have looked at uh, just single athletic teams, so most commonly Australian rules football players. We did kind of a wider net uh, looking at a variety of different athletes and sexes. So you can see our, our subject demographics uh, included uh, men's and women's soccer, women's tennis, and men's football. We brought them into our lab and to do a whole host of preseason screen testing, and this was one of them. Um, so we marked them up in a retroreflective marker setup and had them do single leg hopping for 20 seconds at a self-selected frequency um, in an embedded force plate. Uh, we screened them on dominant limb dominance, and that was counterbalanced. So half the subjects did you know, non-dominant limb first, half the subjects did the dominant limb uh, first after that. And what we found, that the, there was not a significant difference between dominant and non-dominant limb vertical stiffness during single leg testing. Um, we did a paired T-test and found that there really wasn't any difference there. However, when we looked at individuals, we found that the average difference between vertical stiffness uh, was 1.5 kilonewtons per meter with a very significant range. So you can see the range where uh, some individuals were very close and then some individuals displayed a difference of 3.6 kilonewtons per meter, um, which equated to an average of 9% uh, asymmetry difference in vertical stiffness in our athletes. Now again, all these athletes were, were healthy and, and able to be tested at this point. Uh, previous literature has found that those who demonstrated a 4.5 higher percent average difference in asymmetry and vertical stiffness during preseason testing went on to sustain a, a lower extremity soft tissue injury. Um, so we feel our 9% actually fits quite nicely in there uh, with, our, with, with our initial preseason uh, healthy athletes. Uh, kind, of our, kind of our conclusion, we found that this provided a potentially more robust understanding for vertical stiffness in a variety of different sports and athletes. And we still believe that this could continue to be used as a preventative screening tool to potentially reduce, reduce lower extremity tissue burden. Um, and we do have injury data on these athletes. We are just currently analyzing it from the, from the entire year. Uh, thank you. And again, I welcome any questions or, or contact about this project. Uh, thank you to our speakers. Um, we uh, have uh, a little bit longer time for our question. We got a full 10 minute block here for our question period. Um, I will, uh, I'll get us started here with uh, some questions for Emily. Um, Emily, um, I'm trying to make sure I'm reading who these questions are from. Um, from Anita Vasada, uh, Emily, great work. Did you use all all components from the IMUs for your predictions, for example, linear acceleration, angular acceleration, or sorry, angular velocity, the magnetometer, and did you, use, did you try any filters to predict posture or just use the IMU uh, data directly? 
Great, thanks for the question, Anita. We used the built-in XSENS um, skeleton and then used uh, two sets of signals, the segment time series orientations and the time series joint angles. Um, but that's a great point that we could add in some additional features like the linear accelerations if we wanted to add more model inputs. Um, we think we have time for uh, maybe a couple questions here. So from Dennis uh, Anderson, very nice work. Are your moment prediction subject specific? Um, if not, could you uh, put in some subject specific information to improve predictions um, and, and how you might generalize to new subjects? Awesome, thanks for the question. Right now we're doing K-fold validation by participant, which means we use participant one and two to train a model that, that's then tested on participant three. Um, so that given participant is withheld from model training and then tested on that. Um, so that's giving us an idea of how all well this generalizes across participants. Um, and as we collect additional participant data, we'll investigate more how well this model generalizes to new participants. And we're also are considering any sort of participant specific calibrations that mo may result in more robust estimations. Excellent. Uh, there are some more questions. Again, uh, let's please tune into our Slack channel. Yeah. So I have a, a question from Robin for Jacob. Uh, and a thought that Robin had was trying to induce uh, an asymmetry from limb length differences. Do you think that approach would show lumbar moment differences? And maybe they were not, the patients or the subjects you used were not perturbed enough. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, evidently they weren't perturbed enough to get a lower back joint force difference, right? Um, we did look at lower back moments uh, in the analysis, and there is some subtle statistical differences in the frontal plane for some of our perturbations. But uh, yeah, the perturbations weren't high enough. We tried to select perturbations, especially like the walking boot that is clinically relevant, and the other differences that weren't so severe that you would say, well, of course, but maybe we should have tried a different approach of starting from the severe and working our way back to see at what level is like the tipping point for higher uh, forces in lower back. Very cool. And Jacob, I'm just going to repeat the question I asked that you, you've already really done a good job answering, but um, so I just understand, and, and gate's not my thing, but there are just asymmetries on the subject level, subject to subject. Do you think that the magnitude of symmetries in just healthy subjects would ever reach the magnitude necessary or uh, possible for, to elicit low back pain? Or is this something that you'll really only see in clinical situations? Uh, well, there's a couple parts of that, actually, even more than what I answered there, but because we kind of naturally, I, there's a, I have a poster tomorrow talking about our natural symmetry and also natural symmetry of amputees, and that you actually, even though for amputees specifically, you're walking asymmetrically, that is the, the point of your lowest lower back forces. If you try to make them walk symmetrically, it, force, it makes them higher lower back forces, but um, there are obviously, like I was just saying, tipping points for uh, higher back forces. And clinically, there's things like leg length differences that have been shown, like say over three centimeters, where clinically that will show more higher incidence of lower back pain. Um, and then in things like amputees, their stride length, their uh, symmetry indexes are quite subtle, but you know there's some some differences there too. But uh, again, we also want to make clear that we're talking about forces, and it doesn't a higher force doesn't directly mean that you have back pain, but it's just kind of a, a causality towards leading to it. Sure. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Blake, um, question, uh, how did you uh, control or hydrate the, uh, the tissue during your uh, compression protocols? And do you believe this in impacts the material properties of your tissue? Well, we generally tried to test the tissue uh, as soon as it was harvested from the cadaver. Um, if there was any time that was spent in storage, uh, it was done with previously uh, published protocols um, if we needed to use a physiological based solution. Um, but we tried to uh, test uh, basically almost immediately once the organs were harvested. Um, I don't believe that this would affect any of the material properties as uh, previous literature um, has stated uh, different protocols that should minimize the effect on the material properties versus uh, when storage. Uh, Blake, uh, is common from cadaver uh, tissue studies, your, your donors were um, older adults. Um, do you feel that there is a, an age-related effect here? Viscoelastic property changes might be different in, the, in younger adults. Do you think this is applicable across ages? 
Well, so the, yeah, the difficulty with uh, this type of work is uh, uh, trying to understand that our subjects are of uh, uh, very old <laughs> um, and, in, and uh, investigating the age issue would be very difficult as the, the resources are uh, very hard to obtain. Um, the number of cadavers we would need just to perform this work uh, makes it uh, extremely difficult. Um, and so I don't really have insight on that at the moment. Um, I know that with the cadavers we've had with other tissues that we've studied, um, you know, we, we weren't um, seeing anything with age, uh, but I would not like to uh, conclude anything as I truly don't know. We need more research to figure that out. Thank you, excellent. Uh, FJ, got a couple questions for you. I'm gonna combine two questions actually, because it seems like people are interested in if you can tell the differences between respective sports and their athletes, uh, or can you find differences in stiffness or injury risk between men and women? And if you could, could you comment on why you think that those differences might exist? We, we were certainly interested on in that. Our numbers just didn't support looking at that analysis in this initial pass. We definitely parsed people out between between teams and certainly between sexes as well. We didn't see any differences in this initial cohort. Um, and we were interested in building kind of a more robust database of, you know, do soccer players look different than a football or a basketball cohort? And do men's and women's soccer players look different than each other? So we're definitely very interested in that. Um, then there's some data to suggest that men might have a slightly higher stiffness depending on the sport. Um, we were actually, when we started collecting these um, athletes, it really became a question of, we were talking about um, specialization among sports. So soccer players generally all look very similar and have similar characteristics. But when we started talking about looking at the football athletes, we kind of tar started discuss discussing, you know, <clears throat> linemen versus wide receivers versus fullbacks versus quarterbacks and really talking about skill positions. So we did, there's definitely some avenues to go down based on the sport and the sex that I think would be very interesting to look at. Very cool. And, um, and I'm going to back. Okay, he's walking towards the door. Um, I'm going to follow up with one more uh, question. So, did you track if patient if your subjects had had any past injuries? Um, do you feel like there's anything, uh, any pathological history that might contribute to the stiffness measurements at that point in time? We we did take an injury history screening form um, that we're going to look at as well when we start looking at. Um, the, the injuries that they went on to sustain. And I think there's been some data to suggest if you're injured once, that there might be some changes and alter your stiffness values moving forward um, from a soft tissue perspective. So we're, we're interested to potentially include that as a, as a caveat for who went on to go on to get injured. And I think I saw another question, acute versus chronic. We're definitely, that's what we're kind of wrestling with right now. If you went on to get an acute injury, was it something you know, did you pull your hamstring again? Does that count as a chronic injury if you had it before you came here? Or is this an acute injury because you sustained it in a more traumatic fashion? So we're definitely wrestling with how to qualify all these, all these potential injuries for, for these athletes. Very cool. Thank you, FJ. Okay, I think we'll uh, move on to our next uh, block of speakers. Um, we will uh, start with um, uh, Drof Gupta um, from University of Tennessee, uh, optimizing whole body kin uh, kinematics using OpenSim MoCo uh, to reduce peak uh, non-sagittal plane knee loads and ACL injury risk during single leg jump landing. Uh, hello everyone, this is Dhruv Gupta from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and today I'm going to talk about finding optimal kinematics that would reduce the risk of ACL injury during single leg jump landing. Over 200,000 ACL injuries occur in the US every year, and more than 90% of these occur either during single leg jump landing or during sidestepping. How does the injury occur? It occurs due to the anterior tibial force working in conjunction with the varus valgus knee movements and the internal rotation knee movements. When does the injury occur? It occurs during the weight acceptance phase, which starts as soon as the athlete touches down on the ground until the first local minimum in the vertical ground reaction force. So the purpose of the study is to find optimal kinematics that would reduce the peak non-sagittal plane knee loads, which is essentially a vector sum of the varus valgus knee loads and the uh, internal rotation knee movement 
during the wait acceptance phase. So I'm gonna do this using two different optimization techniques. First one uses the res residual reduction algorithm in OpenSIM. This is a two-step process. In the first step, we essentially make sure that the experimental data is accurately represented in the computer environment. And the second step is where we actually try to find the optimal kinematics. So we do two things here. One is that we reduce the maximal torque generating capacity of the relevant actuators. So in this case, the varus valgus knee moment and the uh, internal rotation knee moment. And the second thing we do here is that we reduce the tracking weights of the experimental kinematics, which allows the optimizer to generate new motions. And this is essentially done at each time, time frame. I actually already applied this technique two years ago and I presented the results in this very conference. But the thing is that it takes about 13 hours to converge. That's okay for a dissertation, but from a clinical point of view, it's far too slow. So we are exploring this other optimization technique called direct collocation. So what direct collocation does is that it does trajectory optimization of the controls instead of optimization at each time point. So this is a one step process and this should be faster. OpenSIM Moco is a user friendly software that helps us implement direct collocation. So I took data from two different participants and in order to make a fair comparison between the two techniques, I used the same generic actuators, tracking weights and same scaled models for each participant. And in the second step of the RRA based technique and the OpenSIM Moco technique, I use the same constraints and the same cost functions. And what did I compare? I compared the optimal kinematics generated by both the techniques and also the reduction in peak non sagittal plane knee moments from both the techniques. So we found that the difference in optimal kinematics generated from both the techniques was less than a degree for both the participants. We also found that the reduction in peak non sagittal plane knee moments was at least 40% for both the techniques for both the participants. Now let's talk a little bit about the mechanism. So here the green knee is the experimental data. The red knee is the optimal kinematics generated by RRA based technique. And the blue knee is the optimal kinematics generated by the open Simoco technique. So what the optimizers do is that they place the knee closer to the ground reaction force vector and that reduces the lever arm of the ground reaction force vector about the knee and that in turn reduces the non sagittal plane knee moment. But here is the good part. The open Simoco technique converges within about six hours compared to 13 hours that the RRA based technique takes. So in conclusion, both the methods are able to produce optimal kinematics, which are identical, but the OpenSIM MOCO technique is twice as fast. We think that for lower velocity movements, the OpenSIM MOCO technique will converge even faster and it has a potential to produce results within a clinically relevant time frame. So imagine this, a person comes in and gets tested in the morning. We push the data through OpenSIM MOCO and in the very same afternoon, the doctor is looking at the optimal kinematics. I believe that my research can help bridge the gap between scientific tool and clinical practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very cool. Our next presenter is Brian Diefenbach from East Carolina University. And the title of his talk is Development of an In Vivo Ligament Loading Device. There we go. All right, thanks Josh for the introduction there. Let me throw these slides back up. So um, as Josh mentioned, development of an in vivo ligament loading device. And it's well known that ACL injury rates are on the rise and lead to development of osteoarthritis and an overall decreased quality of living. Um, and so ideally, you know, we could find some way to prevent these ACL injuries. And so the novel idea of this study here is perhaps we could strength train our ligaments to make them stronger, uh, make them better, better prepared to withstand larger loads and uh, make them overall more preventable to injury. Um, so how could we do this though? Um, it has been shown that tissues in the body uh, respond anabolically to high frequency, low magnitude loading. Uh, this is especially true in bone um, as shown here in this modeled bone. Uh, this loading, this high frequency, low magnitude loading in bone increased the bone mineral density. Um, and so perhaps we could use this high frequency, low magnitude load 
uh, to load a ligament to make it stronger. So naturally then the, the purpose of this study was to see if we could develop some sort of device that could apply this load to a ligament in vivo. Um, and then also to identify what genes would be altered in expression um, in response to this loading. And so to apply this high frequency load to a ligament, a custom made device was built termed the Rackle Loader, the Rabbit Anterior Cruciate Ligament Loader. And the first part of this device uh, shown in blue here is the motor and the spring which power the device. And so as seen in this video, which will probably be a little slow due to the lag over Zoom, uh, the spring is of, of a specific displacement and stiffness, and this is what will affect the uh, load frequency and the loading magnitude. And there was a lot of time spent tweaking the device um, and testing numerous springs uh, with various stiffnesses and displacements uh, to find this proper spring that we could use. Uh, this spring is attached to a load cell and a cord which pulls on the knee cast. And this knee cast is highlighted in green in the bottom right here. Um, and this, the second kind of part of the device, this area of the rack loader is where the knee complex of the rabbit is secured. And then lastly in black is where the rest of the rabbit is comfortably seated. And so we were able to achieve um, the proper high frequency, low magnitude load that we wanted. Uh, we were able to determine a spring with the proper parameters um, and kind of fine tune this device to achieve this high frequency, low magnitude load that was then applied to the ACL of the rabbit. And this video here kind of shows a representation um, of this loading on a modeled rabbit knee. And so then we took actual rabbits and loaded their ACL um, along the anatomical axis at a low magnitude oscillating load between about two to 12 Newtons uh, at 15 Hertz for 20 minutes. Um, and during this, the knee of the rabbit was fixed at 30 degrees flexion with respect to the sagittal plane. Uh, and then following four hours post loading, both of the rabbit's ACLs were harvested and the RNA in those ACLs were tested for their genetic expression. And so only um, in this study here, only the left leg of the rabbit was loaded. And this allowed us to compare the genetic expression of this leg to the internal control, as you can see here in the image. Uh, this comparison resulted in only three differentially expressed genes. However, we also had rabbits that received no loading at all. And these were our external control rabbits. And so this allowed us to compare the loaded leg of the rabbit that was in the rack of loader to the external control leg, um, which was again, the same leg on the rabbit that received no loading. And this comparison between the loaded ACL and the external control resulted in 121 differentially expressed genes. As you can see here, grouping these genes by function, uh, we have genes that are responsible for tissue repair, um, collagen synthesis, mechanotransductive and signaling properties. Um, but one gene that really stood out to us was this gene TNX beta. And as we can see here, TNX beta was upregulated in the loaded ACL samples uh, compared to the external control ACL samples. And so again, TNX beta is important as it uh, helps regulate uh, collagen formation and collagen synthesis. So in summary here, uh, this is, you know, a definite promising first step in this novel approach with a high frequency, low magnitude load to prevent ACL injuries, uh, but there's still a lot more to do. Uh, we did make key first steps, though, that I think will kind of shape the future um, in the direction of this work. So first, you know, we had to design some sort of device uh, that could apply a high frequency, low magnitude loading, and we were successful in doing this. And then we also needed to verify that, you know, the ligament would actually respond to this loading, and we also did this. Uh, future studies should definitely look to optimize the, the loading frequency, the loading magnitude, and the duration of loading, and then also test to see if these optimal parameters actually produce a stronger ligament or not. Again, this is all going to contribute to the long-term goal of, you know, one day using this training as a, a novel method to prevent against ACL tears. And I open the floor for any questions after um, the last presentation. Thank you, Brian. Um, our next speaker is uh, Kavya Katagam uh, from Penn State University. She was um, unable to uh, make the session, so we are going to be using her pre-recorded talk. Uh, her talk is titled Achilles Tendon Material Properties Are Resilient to Variations in Load During Growth. Thank you for tuning into my presentation on tendon developmental plasticity in an avian model. In both adult and juvenile animals, including humans, tendons adapt in response to alterations in mechanical load. In adult animals, it's well understood that decreased loading decreases both tendon stiffness and modulus, 
whereas increased loading has the opposite effect. In growing tendon, this load response relation is much less clear. This lack of understanding of how tendon adapts to load during growth is incredibly problematic. We still don't understand what effect altering the load environment during growth will have on the mechanical function of the tendon or the locomotor function of the animal. We also don't know how adaptations will affect the animal in its adult form. We originally hypothesized that during growth, there's a constant load dependent relation between the external load level and tendon stiffness. In order to address this hypothesis, we adopted a bipedal guinea fowl model. These birds reach skeletal maturity in six to eight months, allowing us to easily study their entire growth period. To test this hypothesis, we had three groups, an exercise control group, a restricted movement group, and a Botox group. In order to assess the effectiveness of our treatments at altering the load stimulus, we quantified the amount of movement for each group of birds through video observation. Videos were recorded four times per day across the growth period. We then selected 60 random five minute video segments and analyzed them with a custom written MATLAB script by time stamping observed activities such as walking, standing, sitting, and high acceleration actions, including jumps and sprints. These data were used to compute group averages for the comparison between treatment groups. After the animals reached skeletal maturity, they were sacrificed for tendon material testing. The tendons were secured using two custom clamps and were submerged in a saline bath that was warm to match the average active body temperature of guinea fowl. Force and displacement were both sampled throughout the duration of the testing procedure. Despite the significant differences we found between groups in high intensity activities, such as jumping and sprinting, one-way ANOVA tests indicated no significant differences between groups intended stiffness, modulus, or hysteresis. The effect sizes for these measures were also quite small. We have confidence in our values as they are very close to those found in a previous study also using a guinea fowl model. We initially hypothesized a constant load dependent relation between the external load level and tendon stiffness. However, based on the results of this study, we propose a modified relation that incorporates a lower and upper threshold of external load stimulus necessary to induce tendon adaptation. It is also possible that the relation between stiffness and loading is as we originally hypothesized, but that the characteristics of this change in stress or strain required to induce adaptation, such as magnitude, duration, or rate, were not achieved by our unloading paradigm. If the high intensity activities that were eliminated from our restricted or Botox group animals were not a loading paradigm of the proper characteristics, these animals would remain unmoved along this line, explaining the lack of tendon remodeling. However, we don't have any further evidence to support that this is the case. We also propose that neural factors, rather than muscle or tendon adaptation, might be more closely associated with the improved performance in our exercise group birds. To summarize the main findings of our study, we found that growing tendon is relatively insensitive to load variations. We also proposed a revised hypothesis of tendon adaptation during growth that suggests that maintaining a minimum load threshold may be important for proper tendon growth and health. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me via email or Twitter. And our last speaker is Matt Ruder from the Henry Ford Bone and Joint Center. And the title of his talk is Running Exposure is Associated with Achilles Tendon Shear Wave Speed. Hi, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so, yep, I'm Matt Ruder uh, from Henry Ford. Um, and I'll be talking about how uh, ex running exposure is, is associated with Achilles Tendon Shear Wave Speed. Um, so Achilles tendinopathy is one of the most common running injuries, but it's uh, not well understood how it develops. It's likely influenced by many factors such as 
running volume and age that over time increase the tendon stiffness. Uh, overall, the relationships between age, uh, running experience, mileage, uh, the mechanical properties of the tendon, um, and in the development of Achilles tendinopathy are not well understood. Uh, therefore, the objective was to use shear wave elastography, which is a non-invasive imaging technique that estimates the tissue mechanical properties to assess the associations between uh, shear wave speed and some measures of running exposure. So our uh, hypothesis uh, was based on previous research that found that uh, higher running volume led to an increase in stiffness. Therefore, our hypothesis, therefore, our, um, uh, hypothesis was um, that uh, higher running exposure would be associated with higher shear wave uh, speed in the Achilles tendon. Um, so our study had six uh, experienced male runners. Um, they self-reported the number of years running and their average weekly mileage. Um, we used uh, the number of years running as a long-term estimate of exposure, um, while we use weekly mileage as a short-term estimate of exposure. And the weekly mileage was for the past three months. Um, so our experimental procedure was uh, having the subject first walk um, on a treadmill for five minutes. Um, they were then, and the purpose of that was to uh, precondition the Achilles tendon. Um, we then positioned them on an exam table with their legs fully extended off. Um, we identified the tendon and B-mode ultrasound. Um, we acquired five images on both left and right side and then averaged all of those uh, to have one shear wave uh, speed average for um, each, uh, each subject. Uh, we calculated the correlation coefficient between shear wave speed, age, the number of years running, and weekly mileage. So we found a strong positive relationship between shear wave speed and the number of years running. Um, so this means that more years running was associated with higher shear wave speed. Since uh, shear wave speed is an indirect measure of tissue properties, this suggests that long-term uh, running exposure is associated with an increase in Achilles stiffness. Uh, so for the average weekly mileage, um, we found that there was a strong negative relationship with shear wave speed, and, uh, but it was not significant. Um, so in this, uh, for weekly mileage, th this means that lower mileage was associated with higher shear wave speed, which, su which suggests that lower short-term running exposure is associated with uh, an increase in Achilles stiffness over time. There is no association found between uh, shear wave speed and age. However, our findings may be confounded uh, somewhat by underlying associations between number of years running and weekly mileage, um, as we found a strong significant correlation between these measures. Um, so future efforts should uh, work on understanding the relationships between uh, shear wave speed and these measures of running exposure um, in the development of the tendinopathy. So it's interesting to note that um, higher shear wave speed was associated with higher uh, years running, um, but lower weekly mileage. Um, previous research has found that uh, years running is a, is a risk factor for, in the development of Achilles tendinopathy. Um, previous research has also identified that um, individuals with Achilles tendinopathy tend to have lower um, shear wave speed than healthy. Um, so it's therefore unclear how much uh, the acute and chronic stiffness contribute to in the development of Achilles tendinopathy. Um, however, the study provides preliminary evidence that shear wave elastography could aid in understanding between uh, running and uh, mecha the mechanical properties of Achilles tendinopathy and the, and the Achilles tendon in general. Um, however, our low sample size um, and the lack of a full assessment of the Achilles uh, pathology um, prevents us from uh, for making more concrete conclusions. Um, therefore, more research is warranted um, in understanding these complex relationships. Um, thanks for your time. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them either here, email, or on Slack. Thank you to all our speakers in this uh, block. Um, we have uh, 10 minutes for some, some questions. Uh, if you uh, 
can continue to uh, enter our questions into um, our chat. Um, I'd appreciate it. Um, I'll get us uh, started off here with a question from Sujata to Drove. Um, thank you, very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering what optimization criteria uh, you used for your simulations in uh, OpenSim Moco. Um, and also, did you look at the muscle activation for the task being simulated? Uh, thanks a lot, Sujata, for the question. Uh, we are not using muscles right now, uh, but that's definitely the next step. So we wanted to start with the torque actuators first. And uh, uh, the cost function that we are using is the standard uh, sum of squared activations of all the actuators. Uh, but the important thing is that uh, we add the constraints uh, in, in there. So the uh, knee varus valgus moment and the knee internal rotation moment are constrained. So those actuators are not allowed to go, their activation is not allowed to go really high. Uh, so that kind of uh, uh, reduces the non sagittal plane knee moment. And additionally, we allow the, uh, the tracking of the experimental kinematics to be lower. So that allows it, us to find new kinematics. Hope that answers your questions. Uh, I also wanted to ask, it, um, it appeared that you had compared um, the amount of reduction in your torque across your two different algorithms, and both showed significant reductions, although those reduction numbers to me seem to vary a bit. Did you overall compare the overall torque patterns and look to see where the, the torque patterns that resulted from your torque actuators, how similar uh, were they across your two optimization criteria? I, I did not go very deep. So I did have a, a can I share my screen? Is that okay? I think so, yes. You yeah. should be able to. So, there we go. So, there, uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. Uh, is it on the, oh, sorry. Is, there, is that it? Yeah, yeah. So, I was just, yep. Yeah, so this is the, uh, the, act, the pattern. Um, so, the, Oh, sorry. This is the kinematic. I'm sorry. This is not yeah, the act. Sorry. That's what, I was, saying, that's what yeah. I was. I would say the kinematics I saw, but I wondered if you had the kinetics. Yeah. So we did have the kinetic kinetics, but I did not compare what uh, time it changed. Uh, it's definitely the next thing that I would do. Uh, the main point was that they both were able to reduce it by a significant significant amount. Uh, and then another, the the, uh, the main thing was the mechanism was the same, uh, pulling the knee towards the ground reaction force vector. So that was the main point. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Brian, uh, you have several questions, two from your previous Michigan colleagues. So I'm going to sort of combine a question that I was, I wanted to ask with one from uh, David Liff. So first, how many differentially expressed genes would you generally expect to find if you were comparing one un untrained rabbit to another untrained rabbit? Uh, yeah, uh, so do you want to ask? Go ahead. No, you can just answer that and then I have a follow up. All right. So I would say, um, you know, you're definitely going to get um, more genetic variants when you're comparing within subjects versus, you know, subject to subject. And so one way to kind of account for that is to look at the log fold effect size. Um, and when, you know, looking through all of our genes, one of our filters uh, to test for any genetic um, expression differences was over a log fold change of two as far as the effect size. And so that gene that I highlighted, um, TNX beta, between um, the two rabbits had a log fold effect size change of over seven and a half. So um, definitely um, there's going to be a difference in the genetic variance between the two, um, but we wanted to make sure, um, you know, we also took that into account. Cool. Uh, and the follow-up question from Dr. Lips, what do you think is driving the best difference in genetic response between the internal controls and the external controls when compared to the loaded ACL? Yeah, that's a really good question too. Um, so we, we kind of hypothesize that there's some sort of systemic effect going on um, since we see a lot less genes that are differentially expressed um, within the loaded ACL and the internal control. Um, and kind of looking into other previous literature, this makes sense too. We you know bone um, ad adaptation, whether it's um, osteoporosis can be systemic, but also bone loading. Um, and then also muscle, there's been a lot of literature out there, you know, training in one limb on one side and getting responses in the other side. So we think that there might be some sort of systemic effect going on here with at least the genetic expression um, and the ligament. Cool. And I'll get last question. Um, do you think that there would be sex differences in the gene response? Did you look into that? And if not, could you speculate as to if there would be those differences? 
Yeah, so um, all the rabbits that we tested were um, female rabbits. They were all retired female breeders. Um, obviously, there's going to be some genetic variance between uh, males and females. Um, we chose to test females um, kind of based on its application to ACL injuries with females having a, a higher rate of ACL injuries. Um, as far as the, you know, the, the response, um, it, might, it definitely could be different um, just due to some of the hormones that are, that are different between males and females and how the hormone and circulating response might play into that systemic effect as well. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Ross. Uh, so our next speaker, Kavya, is, is not able to join us, so uh, please direct all questions to her to our Slack channel, or she also did give you uh, an email or a Twitter there on her talk. Um, you could try to contact her directly as well. Mm -hmm. um, but there were a couple questions for Matt that I think we could ask to finish up. Um, one was, and I know that Matt touched on this a little bit, but what was the age distribution in the runners in your study? And do you think that age or some other physical activity might be confounding factors for, with regard to Achilles stiffness? Uh, and if, if you think there are, what, what other you know, uh, physical activities might be those factors? Yeah, um, so our age range was uh, between uh, 34 and 56. Um, and so like that was definitely a factor in, um, that's kind of what I was trying to note with the association between the um, our two measures of running exposure with years running and uh, weekly mileage. Um, since the um, our older runners uh, didn't tend to, they were definitely running less, and uh, the younger ones were fairly active and like running, you know, multiple races in a year, and um, you know, still training for marathons, whereas the older ones were tending to, you know, kind of, you know, the longest that they would go is you know, doing a 5K or um, a half marathon and if they're going to race at all. Um, so that's definitely a factor. Um, we didn't control for age. Uh, just wanted to get like a kind of a broad, um, you know, representation of age across the, across there. Sure. Um, did you control for BMI or weight or anything like that? Uh, we didn't control for either of those, no. Um, Do you think they would have an effect on your measurements? Um, I don't think so. We did try to measure one of the things that we were looking at initially was looking at the um, the, the Moen arm uh, of the um, so essentially the the, uh, the distance between the the ground and the their ankle. Um, and so we were trying to see if there was any relationship there. We didn't find anything. So um, I don't think um, that that probably would have any effect. Um, but uh, it's certainly possible. Well, so how do you how do you see this research going in the future? Because it'd be fascinating if you were able to recruit uh, young runners that at low mileage, young runners at high mileage, and then you know older runners at high mileage and low mi mileage to kind of control for all those variables in your study design. Yeah, uh, like. My, like long term with my goal for would, uh, would be for this to have, like you said, like a broad design where that you have these high, um, high mileage uh, runner in age categories um, and then be able to use, uh, be able to like follow them uh, over the course of like a training plan and seeing if there's changes in um, the Achilles as they train. Um, so and like in the expanded also to other you know um other soft tissues in the leg so because it's certainly you uh what we did in the achilles you could certainly do um in the gastroc or you know hamstring or um you know in the uh, uh in the quad so like you have all you, you could do all of those and like have a pretty robust study very cool thank you so Matt, we got about another minute, so I'm going to cheat and use moderator privilege to ask another question. Uh, Matt, we recently uh, published something where we were looking at intrinsic uh, foot tendons, and we saw a similar relationship between training load and decreasing uh, stiffness, but that, that uh, relationship was dependent on footwear type. Um, do you know what uh, the standard footwear was for your runners? Uh, they were all, uh, I can tell you just uh, from memory, uh, we weren't tracking or anything, but they were all wearing, you know, standard running shoes. None of them were running in um, anything overly maximalist or uh, minimalist. Um, and they were all rear fit runners um, for people that are interested in that as well. The relationship that we saw was amongst people who wear traditional running shoes. So that, that does match what we saw as well. It's interesting. Okay. Cool. 
Uh, I think that marks the end of our time period. I uh, want to thank all of our speakers. Uh, it was a good session here. I hope we can continue to have some uh, lively discussion in our Slack sessions. I think there was uh, some questions that we didn't get to, but I hope that we generate some additional questions from the discussion there as well. So uh, please uh, participate um, and uh, we'll see you at other sessions. Good job, everyone. Oh, yes. Also, you can participate in the Delsus Lounge, location one. <laughs>